Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to attend my talk. My name is Ray Morans. I'm a pollinator ecologist with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and I'm also a partner biologist with the USDA NRCS. And of course, the topic of my talk today is studying the effects of fire and grazing on butterflies and their habitat, which is a topic I've been working on and off for the last 15 years. First, to introduce you to my employer, the Xerces Society. We are a nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon, that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We have regional offices in various parts of the country, and we were named after the little blue butterfly in the lower left. I'm sad to say that butterfly went extinct. So we were formed to try to keep other butterflies and other insects and other invertebrates from going extinct. We have a variety of programs that help to enact on the ground conservation. Our largest programs are our pollinator program and our endangered species program. But as you can see, we have a variety of other programs. I also work for the NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And the mission of the NRCS is to deliver conservation solutions so agricultural producers can protect natural resources and feed a growing world. And before the pandemic, I was located in an NRCS office here in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Of course, right now I'm working out of home. So the outline of this presentation, I'm gonna give a brief intro on the biology of monarchs and regal fritillaries. I'm then gonna get into the meat of talking about fire and grazing effects. I'll have a couple slides on best management practices and then finish up with some additional resources for you. Well, this butterfly doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, it's the most recognizable butterfly in the country, the monarch butterfly, of course. Um, talk a little bit about its life cycle because it's so important. We start off with a egg, of course and the egg hatches to become a first star larva. Uh, eventually that grows larger and molts into various other instars of larvae. Then this really large fifth instar larva uh, goes up on some surface, hangs upside down and changes into a pupa. And then after 10, to, 10 days to two weeks, the pupa turns into an adult. Monarchs are host plant specialists. Many butterfly species are, monarchs definitely are. Monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweed. They have to have milkweed for their development. So I've got a little quiz question for you. How many species of milkweeds are there in the United States? You can see the choices. Take a few seconds to think. How many different kinds of milkweeds have you seen? How many might there be in the US? Well, the answer is there are more than 100 species of milkweeds. It's actually an extremely diverse group. And now a quiz of your botanical knowledge, another quiz. What native plant genus do monarch larvae eat? Is milkweed known as Asclepius or Sinancum or Phenastrum or any of these other names? What is the scientific name for the genus of plants that monarch larvae eat? The answer, once again, all of the above. I bet many of you were thinking Asclepius, which definitely is a good milkweed genus, but we have other genera of milkweeds. Uh, these three genera all do occur in Ohio, Asclepius, Sinancum, and Metelia. Uh, Sinancum and Metelia are vines, and these three species, I'm sorry, these three genera are vine milkweeds that live in the, in the South, Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, South Carolina, places like that. But again, back to Ohio, what you typically see uh, monarch larvae on are using species like this, butterfly milkweed, which is recorded in almost every county of Ohio and has been recorded in more counties uh, in the US than any other milkweed species. It's very widespread. This species really loves well-drained soil, by the way, if you wanna grow it. Uh, but the one that's probably most commonly used, certainly most commonly used, actually in Ohio is common milkweed, is Sclepius syriaca. Milkweeds are named for the milky sap, of course, and they're known for their chemical defenses. These chemical defenses 
are known as cardiac glycosides or also known as cardenolides. These cardenolides help protect milkweed plants from being consumed by numerous types of herbivores. But of course, monarch larvae are able to consume milkweeds and the monarch larvae, when they consume the milkweeds, incorporate the cardenolides into their tissues and those cardenolides stay within the individual so that when it turns into an adult, that adult is unpalatable to birds like the blue jay. Now it turns out not all of the monarchs are unpalatable. Some of them just taste just fine. But this one you see here made the blue jay sick. Monarchs use various nectar species, but they do use preference, do show preferences. So of the thousands of species of flowering plants in Ohio, monarchs only visit a few species frequently. They're sort of picky. And some of the plants that they like, probably the three most important families for them, most important are the aster family, the dogbane family, the mint family. Those would be the biggest three. But I threw in the coffee family, this plant here, uh, button bush. I want to point out that monarchs have three major populations in the lower 48. We've got a non-migratory population in South Florida. We've got a population west of the Rockies that migrates primarily to California coast. And the eastern population, in other words, Ohio and other places around it, and they migrate to Mexico. They migrate to places like this, Sierra Chinqua in Michoacan, and they spend the winter in this beautiful for, fir forest. Uh, I got to visit uh, these sites uh, two years ago. It was an amazing trip. Uh, and of course, this site, El Rosario, in some years has hundreds of millions of monarchs, at least it used to before their population declined. Still has tens of millions. So many monarchs that during the course of the winter, a whole bunch of them end up dying due to starvation or other reasons, and the forest floor is cut carpeted with monarchs. In the spring, they start to head back north. So those monarchs that spent the winter in Mexico fly back to the southern US and they lay eggs and die. Their offspring fly further north to the Midwest uh, and begin the breeding season in the Midwest. Uh, by July, things are really hopping in the northern US, lots of monarchs in a good year. And then, of course, they fly back to Mexico. I want to point out that monarchs are habitat generalists. And what you see here are a variety of the habitats that they'll use. Tall grass prairie, savanna, pasture, in some cases cropland. In the south, they use pine flatwoods, cypress swamps, salt marshes, and beaches. So monarchs have been in decline. The eastern population, uh, for decline for about 20, 30 years, and this graph shows that. The Western population has declined even more severely. In the 80s, uh, my employer, the Xerxes Society, estimated that there were 4.5 million monarchs overwintering in California in most years. In, from 2010 to 2017, that number had dropped all the way down to 300,000, but the last few years it's been horribly, horribly dismal. Uh, last year, there were only 29,000 monarchs that we counted in the West. And this winter, the official account uh, just came out, and we counted 1,912 monarchs west of the Rockies this year. So the Western monar monarchs have declined by over 99% in the last three years. Uh, because of this grim news about monarchs, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service considered listing them. And of course, they announced just a few weeks ago that the monarch deserves to be on the Endangered Species Act, but it's precluded because they have too many other species that they need to get to first. So that was the decision by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on December 15th. Now, this species, uh, extremely colorful, but most of you haven't seen it. This is the regal fritillary, Spiaria idalia. Uh, you can see uh, very different on the dorsal surface from the ventral surface, uh, very striking butterfly. This species is a host plant specialist as well, and the caterpillars feed on violets. 
the adults, like monarchs, uh, have their preferences as far as what nectar plants they like to visit. They actually use many of the same nectar plants that monarchs do, and these are a few of them here. As opposed to monarchs, which were habitat generalists, regal fritillaries are habitat specialists, especially in the central U.S. where they, they are highly, highly focused on and restricted to native tall grass prairie, such as you see here in Oklahoma on the left and uh, Iowa on the right. So this map shows the distribution of regal fritillaries, at least the original distribution. In this map, blue is a good thing. It shows counties where regal fritillaries were known to occur at one point. You can see they had a broad distribution and they were found in many counties of Ohio. But now this map, blue is a very bad thing. Blue means that we think the regal fritillary has been extirpated from those states. So the ex regal fritillary is believed to have disappeared from numerous states, including Ohio. Now this shows Oklahoma as one of them. Uh, we still have a few in Oklahoma. Um, at least in 2019, we found four in a survey we did. And I'm pretty sure there are more hanging out on some large private ranches. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is considering listing the regal fritillary uh, as a threatened species. And that uh, they've been working on that for a few years. Uh, they'll let us know probably in 2022. So now I will get to the nitty gritty of fire effects. Fire can have direct effects on butterfly and the direct effect can only be negative. Uh, it can kill them, it can incinerate them particularly the immobile forms, the eggs, the larvae, the pupae. The seminal work on fire effects in butterflies was produced by Anne Swengel um, in 1996. Anne is a self-funded butterfly ecologist in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And in this publication in Biological Conservation, volume 76, uh, she produced a very provocative paper on the effects of fire and hay management on the abundance of prairie butterflies. And the main conclusion of it was that fire uh, kills lots of prairie butterflies and reduces their abundance, particularly uh, rare species like the regal fritillary. She did not actually detect whether or not larvae were killed, but her research found there were fewer regal fritillary adults in recently burned prairie. Additional evidence of mortality due to fire uh, comes from some studies that I'll describe right now. Uh, a study of the Arogo skipper, this beautiful little butterfly on the left, uh, it was ex extirpated from a national forest in Florida due to prescribed burn. The same species is also seemingly extirpated from the entire state of Iowa. It used to occur on many prairie preserves, but it's believed to have been eliminated from those sites by prescribed burning. And then finally, an example from Ohio, I'm sad to say the Regal Fritillary used to be at Rest Haven Wildlife Area in Erie County, but people believe it got eliminated from that site based on a single winter burn. So, does fire always kill regal fritillary larvae and pupae? Well, no, not always. Uh, this photo is from 2009 in southern Iowa, and the fellow in the center is Joe Lautenbach, who now lives in Ohio and is a biologist um, in Ohio. And it, but back then we worked together, and I was doing butterfly work, and Joe was doing bird work, and him and his uh, coworker Tori called me and said, Ray you got to get out here. There are lots of regal fritillaries, and we can pick them up with our hands. So I rushed out to this prairie, and they were dragging for birds with a rope trying to find bird nest. But while they were doing that, they were finding uh, little creatures on the, on the grass, regal fritillaries. This was in prairie that had burned five months earlier, so the assumption would be there were no regal fritillaries because the fire had killed the caterpillars and yet they were finding them. And more importantly, these butterflies were so, um, they were so immobile. They had just come out of their pupae, which was proof that they had not flown in from somewhere else. They had spent the winter in this prairie. 
So why did they get killed by the winter fire? Well, Tori and Joe told me that they had been involved in this burn, and this burn had been patchy because it had some small areas of tall fescue, and the tall fescue doesn't burn well. So that prevented the, the whole prairie from burning. And so my presumption is that in spots like this with tall fescue and this, there were some regal fritillary caterpillars hanging out and they survived the fire. They did not get burned. Uh, another neat uh, example of something like this uh, comes from the work of Kelsey McCullough et al, uh, part of uh, Kansas State University. And you can see what journal it was published in. This was published just three years ago. And what they found in their study of regal fritillaries, they found many, many regal fritillaries in areas that had just been burned, and they found the caterpillars. They, they searched on the soil and they found caterpillars. Uh, the best explanation for it is that the caterpillars were hiding out under the rocks during the burn. They did their research in the Flint Hills of Kansas, which is a four million acre uh, region of native tall grass prairie. It never got plowed because you can't plow it. There are too many rocks, both on the surface and immediately subsurface. So, so we believe the regal fritillary caterpillars hid under the rocks and, and survived the fire that way. I did some research on this topic, along with Sam Fuhlendorf and Dave Engel, and we published it in 2014. And we did the study in Missouri uh, at four uh, prairie preserves in southwestern Missouri. And we examined how regal fritillaries and their nectar sources were impacted by fire, grazing, and sampling period. I'm not going to talk much about sampling period. I will talk right now about fire. But first, I'll show you the, a little bit more about the study design. At each of those four prairie preserves, we had two pastures right next to each other. And the pastures were identical to one another, except one of them had cattle, and the other one did not. Otherwise, they were identical in that they were both native tall grass prairie, and each one was split into three burn units, one that was burned in the year of data collection, one that had been burned the previous year, and one that had been burned two years ago, two years prior. Uh, and uh, so we got to see what is the effect of fire on regal fritillary. And what we found is that we had the most regal fritillaries in recently burned prairie. And as the years pass after a burn, we have fewer and fewer regal fritillaries. So why might this be? I'm still of the belief that our regal fritillary caterpillars got incinerated by the fires. However, I think it's very likely that regal fritillaries flew into these burned units from adjacent prairie due to the effects of the fire on the resources that they find so attractive, natural sources. So uh, when we talk about possible indirect effects of fire, there are of course three different options. Fire has no effect, or it reduces the abundance of host plants and or nectar plants, or it increases abundance of host plants nectar plants. We did not look at the effects of fire on the host plant, which of course is violets for regal fritillaries. But we did look at nectar plants, and we found that the most important nectar plant in spring, pale purple cone flower, was greatly stimulated to bloom by fire. So this area had just been burned about three months earlier and those plants produced far more flowers than they would have if that site had not been burned. And we saw huge numbers of regal fritillaries in that piece of prairie. Again, I think drawn in uh, from adjacent prairie due to all those flowers. In mid-July, we found the same thing with tall blazing star. Huge amounts of flowers and huge amounts of regal fritillaries. In another study uh, up in Iowa with Professor Diane Dubinsky, we looked at the effects of burning on butterfly milkweed, which of course is a monarch host plant, but also a great nectar source for regal fritillaries and for monarchs. 
And we found, once again, fire stimulates blooming of butterfly milkweed. And just to show you uh, with some anecdotal information that this phenomenon, positive, a positive effect of fire on nectar plants can occur in various other parts of the country. Uh, this is a photo from South Carolina, a burn that occurred in January 2018. Uh, and then that summer, uh, there were many, many flowers, including uh, the three species you see here. Uh, but the NRCS biologist, Sudi Thomas, who provided me with these photos, uh, pointed out that, yes, burning in South Carolina greatly stimulates nectar plant flower production. So how does fire affect monarchs? Well, that paper I talked about earlier by Swengel, Swengel 96, found that monarchs were most abundant in recently burned prairie. The opposite of what she found for regals, of course. And in a study that I did with Diane Dubinsky, we found the same thing in Iowa and Missouri. And then a study by Leone et al, 2019, found that monarchs were more abundant in burned prairie than grazed prairie. So thus far, good news about the effects of fire on monarchs. But you have to ask yourself, when does most fire happen in prairie country? And this photo gives you a hint. That's me doing a burn in Iowa. Uh, and given the fact that the vegetation's all brown, pretty obvious that this is in winter. And that's when most fire happens in prairie country. So when I'm up in Iowa burnt, doing a burn, where are the monarchs? Well, the monarchs are in the forests of Michoacan, Mexico. So they're not affected. They're not killed by the fire. Instead, they're probably benefited. By the time they make it back up to uh, Iowa or Ohio for that matter in, in May and June, uh, the, the habitat quality is probably improved, uh, almost certainly improved by the fires that are conducted in winter. Well, what about summer fire? How does summer fire affect monarch butterflies? Not many studies on that yet, but uh, but this species is involved in one study of summer burning, and this is green antelope horn milkweed. It does occur in southern Ohio, but I'm betting most of you haven't uh, seen it yet. Even though it does occur in southern Ohio, you can see it's mainly a species of the south central U.S., where it is by far our most abundant milkweed. We have hundreds of millions of these plants in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. And monarchs really like them for laying their eggs on them. And a very important thing to know, they come out in early spring and they go dormant in June. So uh, Kristen Baum and her graduate student uh, in 2012 published a paper looking at the effects of summer burning on this milkweed species. And of course, as I mentioned before, it goes dormant in late June. However, if you burn Oklahoma rangeland in early July, this causes these plants to break dormancy. They come back up and provide lots of great habitat in August and September for monarchs to lay their eggs on. And uh, what you see here is a monarch egg laid on the flower bud of Asclepias viridis. And uh, this happens to be in my uh, prairie on my property. And uh, I don't, I didn't burn this prairie, but I mowed it. Uh, I mowed it in late June. And as you can see here, mowing can also have a positive impact on milkweeds. Um, if you mow prairie in late June in my neck of the woods, that stimulates these milkweeds to come back up. And I know there's some great research from the Northeast and from um, Virginia, I believe, showing that mowing can have positive effects on common milkweeds. So now I want to get into grazing. What are the benefits of grazing for butterflies? Well, grazing can provoke, promote native wildflower diversity. And uh, in North Dakota, where their prairie has been invaded to a very large degree by European exotic grasses, grazing seems to be a really important process for reducing the amount of grasses and allowing the wildflowers to come back up, the native wildflowers, that is. Also, grazing can help provide heterogeneous 
vegetation structure, which can be a good thing for butterfly diversity. However, there are major risks of grazing, the primary one, of course, being overgrazing. Uh, there can be direct effects of this. Butterfly eggs, larvae, pupae can get trampled or they can get eaten. I remember finding a uh, milkweed plant in Iowa and it had a butterfly caterpillar on it. And I wanted to show um, a visitor who was happened to be Dr. Lincoln Brower, the world's greatest monarch expert. I, I wanted to show him that plant the next day. Um, but uh, later that day, a cow came and ate that plant and the caterpillar. Um, probably sort of rare, but it happens. More likely to happen are the indirect effects. Host plants and nectar plants that are palatable to cattle or other livestock can decline or disappear with overgrazing. And uh, I've seen many, 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 many pastures that look just like this. They get overgrazed to the point that there is nothing there but a few grasses, maybe a few shrubs, and the native, native wildflowers have disappeared. That's really bad news for our butterflies and, and other pollinators. So in general, if you do a review of the literature, as we at the Xerces Society did, in general, as grazing intensity increases, butterfly and pollinator abundance and diversity decrease especially once you get to really high grazing intensities. So once, once you get it grazed down really, really short, there just aren't flower resources for the pollinators to obtain nectar and pollen from. The host plants for the butterfly caterpillars have probably been eliminated as well. So I want to talk a little bit about that study I mentioned a few minutes ago. This time I'll talk about the grazing part of it. That was the study in southwestern Missouri. And what we found were that the grazed pastures still had regal fritillaries, which is great news. And you can see uh, here some photos of regal fritillaries that I've pasted on. Uh, interestingly enough, most of the cattle uh, happened to be in one patch, the patch that had got burned really intensely, uh, whereas most of the butterflies were in the other patches. Of that grazed pasture. On the other hand, um, again, ungrazed pastures had far more regal fritillaries than grazed pastures, and they tended to be most abundant, as I mentioned earlier, in the patch that had been burned very recently. So back to the grazed pasture. What explains their low abundance there? Well, Simply put, we believe it's that the cattle ate most of the, the flowers that the regal fritillaries visited. So this is a photo of a portion of one of these cattle pastures in Missouri. And again, it's high quality native tall grass prairie. And the adjacent ungrazed prairie had tons of regal fritillaries. This pasture had no regal fritillaries whatsoever, except, believe it or not, in this tiny grazing exclosure. This tiny uh, grazing exclosure, of course, with fencing that you could hardly see, had huge numbers of pale purple coneflower inside. There was no pale purple coneflower outside of that exclosure. So amazingly, the regal fritillaries like that flower so much that they, we found four of them in the exclosure uh, with the flowers and found none of them in the much larger pasture that surrounds it. So to us, very clear effects that the very intensive cattle grazing was reducing the amounts of nectar plants, which was reducing the numbers of regal fritillary. How does grazing impact monarchs? There have been very few studies on this, I'm sad to say. But as we've already shown with regal fritillaries, it's clear that heavy grazing can reduce or eliminate nectar plants. But what about the effects of grazing on milkweeds? This is a topic I'm really, really interested in. I've been into milkweeds for uh, almost 30 years. Are milkweeds compatible with grazing? Well, as you know, monarch caterpillars need milkweed. But are milkweeds toxic to cattle? They are, right? Can, can we have milkweeds in a pasture with horses and with cattle? 
Won't that kill the horses and the cattle? Well, here's a photo I took uh, last year in Oklahoma of a uh, bison pasture, uh, native tall grass prairie. And you can see that we've got bison here, obviously, and these bright yellow green flowers. This is the Asclepias viridis that I talked about a few minutes ago. Vast amounts of this milkweed, hundreds and hundreds of them per acre. Actually, in places there are thousands per acre. So the milkweeds are doing great in Oklahoma, and the bison are doing great in this spot. They don't seem to have a problem. This is in the same nature preserve, but we have a cattle pasture uh, instead of bison. And this is the best picture I could find of it, but let me guarantee you, there are tons of milkweeds in this cattle pasture, including these right here. The milkweeds are doing great. The cattle are doing great. So why is this? Well, as you probably know, I think I mentioned earlier, cardatolides make some milkweeds toxic to vertebrates. However, scientists at the USDA's Poisonous Plant Research Center in Utah have informed us that they almost never receive reports of livestock losses due to milkweeds. Why not? Because cardatolides found in the milkweeds taste awful. I've never tried to eat a milkweed yet, but I know people who have, and they said that it's extremely bitter. It's important to know that these cardenolide concentrations vary greatly between milkweed species. And here's the crux of the matter. Cattle usually refrain from eating milkweeds with high concentrations of these cardenolides. So to understand the effects of cattle on milkweeds, you need to know what milkweed species you've got and what cardenolide concentration is in that milkweed. And I've created a table uh, showing cardenolide concentrations of seven milkweed species, uh, ranked from highest to lowest. Uh, again, there are over 100 milkweed species, but here are seven. Uh, these top three species are primarily in the southern US. These bottom four species are all found in the northern US. And you can see these northern species have very, very low concentrations of cardenolides. These southern species are extremely high. I was just speaking a few minutes ago about Asclepias viridis and showed you that neither the bison nor the cattle eat the species. So I've decided to throw in a line there that's sort of a boundary line between really toxic milkweeds above the line. They're so toxic that the cattle don't touch them. Below the line, we have milkweeds that are not toxic enough, and therefore cattle probably gobble them up. And in fact, I have a research project showing that cattle often do gobble this species up. And now I'll tell you about a research project by Tim Dixon and others uh, pointing out that cattle are gobbling up common milkweed. So they conducted the study in Nebraska, they compared grazed rangeland to ungrazed rangeland. They had many more milkweeds in ungrazed rangeland. They noticed that cattle in the grazed rangeland ate many of the milkweeds, and yet no adverse effects on the cattle were observed. Now let's look at a data, I'm sorry, a data chart, and it becomes very obvious. Down here, you have data on milkweed stems per acre in the grazed pastures. And you can see the grazed pastures had extremely low densities of milkweed stems. On the other hand, the ungrazed pasture, ungrazed pastures, I should say, had huge numbers of milkweed stems per acre. Of course, the number of stems per acre did decline during the summer because uh, many milkweed plants do get dormant as you head toward fall. But still, that number was always much higher in ungrazed uh, pasture than in grazed pasture. So now I'll get to BMPs. First, for prescribed fire, we at Xerces Society recommend that you burn no more than one third of 
the area of your pasture, your natural area, whatever, um, burn no more than one third in a year to try to minimize the impact of direct mortality. Because we are worried that if you burn the whole thing, you'll wipe out a population of a rare butterfly like the river fritillary or an arogo skipper. If, you, if small portions of your burn unit do not burn up, leave them alone. Don't, don't go out there with a blowtorch, with a drip torch, and try to burn them back up because those small unburned areas can serve as refugia for immobile insects. We do recommend that you rotate the season of burn. That can be a really positive thing so that you're not always having the same effect on the same suite of insects and plants. But because most of the nation needs more prescribed fire, uh, do burn whenever you can. Um, here in the Midwest, I'm sorry, here in the uh, Southern Plains where I live, we need much more fire to help to eliminate the menace uh, caused by the spread of eastern red cedar, which is turning much of our prairie into cedar forest. Okay, now for some BMPs regarding grazing. It's very important to use the proper stocking rate and to allow time for plant recovery. But what is the proper stocking rate? How much time do you need how much time do plants need to recover after a bout of moderate or intense grazing? Not much research has been done on this, as I mentioned before. So please, if you're considering uh, putting livestock on an area with plants that are valuable to pollinators, and you care about those pollinators, then please consult your local NRCS office and ask them to help you determine um, what grazing regime uh, will work best uh, for making sure that the host plants are still there, that the nectar plants are still allowed to bloom. Now, I know Ohio doesn't have lots of rangeland, doesn't have any rangeland. You, instead, you've got pasture, um, various other grasslands, but plenty of, uh, plenty of pasture. You can still have milkweeds in those pastures. You can still have nectar plants in those pastures if you graze them the right way. Well, where can you get more information? about these general topics. Colleagues uh, and I, about a year ago, published a six-page fact sheet titled Rangeland Management and Pollinators, a guide for producers in the Great Plains. This is available as a free download online. Just search for Rangeland Management and Pollinators. Colleagues of mine out west, produced two documents, one on monarchs, one on pollinators in general. These are very lengthy documents providing BMPs for managing rangeland for pollinators out west. Closer to home, if you wanna learn more about the milkweeds of Ohio, consider going online uh, and searching for milkweeds of the Great Lakes. This is a publication that we developed along with Monarch Joint Venture uh, last year. And you can see uh, it's got information on a whole bunch of the, uh, well, actually, that say the nine or 10 most common milkweeds species in Ohio. If you want to learn a lot about nectar plants for monarchs in Ohio, please obtain this document. The Important Plants of the Monarch Butterfly Midwest. To find it, simply search NRCS Monarchs and go to the bottom of the, bottom of the page for links. It's probably about 150 pages. It's quite the book and it's free. Okay, Xerces Society has produced dozens and dozens of documents relevant to pollinators and monarchs and other invertebrates. They're all free downloads from Xerces.org. And please consider connecting with the Xerces Society on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, Nick Shell, the state biologist for Ohio NRCS, for inviting me to give this talk.
And I need to acknowledge the supporters of the Xerces Society. Um, we have quite a quite an array of corporate sponsors, nonprofit sponsors, governmental sponsors, and of course members. And we very much appreciate the assistance we get that enables us to keep doing our work. And of course, those individual members are really important to us. Donors make it possible. So consider becoming a member of the Xerces Society. Thank you very, very much for your time and attention. Um, I look forward to answering any questions you have. Feel free to email me at ray.morans at usda.gov. And I very much look forward to uh, any of your questions or comments. Thank you very much. And uh, hope the rest of the winter goes great for you. Bye-bye.